All right, well, welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Ferguson, Chair of the Concord Planning Board, and I'm calling this meeting, uh, public meeting on Thursday, May 13th, 2021, to order at 7.01 p.m. In accordance with the state's executive order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we're conducting this meeting virtually, and this meeting is being recorded. This public hearing is for the 2021 town, uh, annual town meeting for Article 32 to amend the historic district's map, and Articles 35 to 39, which are zoning bylaw amendments. A member of the Historic District Commission will make a presentation on Article 32, and then a member of the Planning Board will make a presentation on each of the remaining articles. The public hearing is being conducted as a webinar, which means that some participants will be panelists and some will be attendees. Panelists are visible to everyone and include the Planning Board, Town Staff, and the Historic Districts Commission member when they present Article 32. Attendees are not visible, or have audio capability. So if you as an attendee has a question during the presentation on any article, you will use the raise hand function. At the end of each presentation, I'll open it up for public comment and I'll recognize each person individually, at which time you'll be promoted to a panelist so that you have video and audio ability and you can ask a question. It takes just a few seconds uh, to promote people uh, to a panelist. If you're calling into the meeting and you have a question, you can press not star nine to raise your hand and star six to mute and unmute. So we'll remind you of those instructions um, before we take public comment. So I'm gonna take roll call of the planning board members and then um, um, Chris can bring up the first uh, presentation. So let's see who we have here. Um, Mr. Flint. Here. Uh, Mr. Bozette. Here. Ms. Orvidal. Here. Ms. Miller? Here. And I don't believe we have Ms. McEnany, but let me check. And what about Mr. Saya? Okay, and so it's just um, the five of us, this is Ms. Ferguson, and um, thanks, Chris, for bringing up the presentation and handing over the controls to the first presenter. Hey, Mr. Nobly, it's all you. I want to check your mic. Is that any better? Yeah. Can you hear me? All right. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you, Kristen. And uh, thank you all. This is uh, an article we're presenting to amend the Main Street Historic District map. Um, and I'll go through the slides and then see if there are any questions. Uh, next slide, please. So this, uh, this article is to determine whether the town will vote to extend the Main Street Historic District southward to add two properties uh, comprised of 19,578 square feet, more or less, and the buildings located at 21 Thoreau Street and 29 through 31 Thoreau Street, and to amend the map on file in the office of the town clerk entitled Historic Districts Town of Concord accordingly, and that would take effect July 1st of this year, or to take any other action there too. Next slide, please. So this is the edge of the gray area is the current Main Street Historic District, and these are two properties on Thoreau Street. Uh, both of these property owners have asked to be added to the Main Street Historic District, and as these are abutting properties to the existing district, uh, we felt it was non-controversial to expand the district slightly to include these two properties. Next slide, please. Just a little bit of background on each one. At 21 Thoreau Street, this house was originally built around 1862 on the property of 252 Main Street. The house was moved in 1891 or 92 to its current location. It was built by Julius Smith, a house painter and Main Street store owner. <clears throat> and in 1865, the house was purchased by Frederick Hudson. Hudson was a journalist, editor of the New York Herald, and was one of the founders of the Associated Press. Next slide, please. Uh, 29 through 31 Thoreau Street was built around 1843 as a double cottage. Uh, it was originally, it was owned by years for the Gleason, by the Gleason family. Both of these properties are, we in our 
uh, estimation contributing structures to the historic streetscape of Thoreau Street and the Main Street Historic District. And I think that's our last slide. So I would open it up to questions or comments. Um, Ms. Ferguson, there's a hand raised. If you want to go through the planning board first, I'm not sure. Thanks. Can you promote Carlin Reed, please? Yeah. Hi, folks. Carlin Reed, 83 Wits End. Peter, can you tell me why these people want to have their homes added to the historic district? What did they tell you? So what they tell us is that they are concerned about uh, the legacy of their properties and they're seeing uh, homes being torn down around Concord and replaced with new structures and they uh, love these homes and the history of the home and they'd like to see them protected. Does that make sense? Thanks. Oh, of Wrong. course, thank you. Um, can can you promote Dennis Fiore, please? And Dennis, can you please state your name and address for the record before you comment? Unmute, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Dennis Fiore, 309 Strawberry Hill Road. Uh, I'm a member of the HDC. And I think what we're seeing here uh, is a concern by the neighborhood on Thoreau Street about uh, their worry about creeping commercial districts. We saw this last year uh, at the town meeting when there was a movement uh, to create a new drive around the back of the, of the commercial block that houses a Starbucks. And as you, as you realize, the neighbors were not pleased with that. And so I think there is a, a concern in the neighborhood, and I've spoken to some of the neighbors about creeping commercialism, and they'd like to contain that because they feel it's a wonderful residential area so close in town. So I perfectly well understand why these individuals uh, want to want to make sure that these properties uh, survive and and uh, are are not changed dramatically. Thank you, Dennis. I'm not seeing any other hands up, so let me give it just another minute in case anyone is still waiting to do so. If you are on the phone calling in, you can press star nine to raise your hand. I think people are here for the much more exciting articles to follow. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Peter. Appreciate the You're presentation. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Um, now we're on to the zoning bylaw amendments. And uh, oh, Heather, would you wave in your hand? Or is she saying goodbye? Okay. Um, Bye. All right. So, there are, um, so as Chris is bringing up the, um, the first zoning bylaw amendment, for the tree preservation bylaw, I believe, um, there are 29 attendees joining us tonight that I can see in addition to the eight panelists. And I'm, I'm happy to um, summarize this uh, tree preservation bylaw. Um, you can go ahead and uh, next slide, please. So the objectives of this amendment um, are to, we, this is a, the tree preservation bylaw has been in place for a couple of years now. So we've had some time to gather data. And so um, we've got a couple of, uh, just a few minor changes that were recommended uh, to strengthen the bylaw. We're doing this to re uh, require reinspection of tree protection measures if the construction takes longer than a year, to require tree protection of invasive trees if the property owner wants it to remain, and to require tree planting and or transplanting to meet American National Standards Institute, that's ANSI standards that um, we've also defined on the website. Next slide, please. Oh, that was it. So, so to add just a little bit more, and, and we I think people have attended uh, um, uh, planning board meetings in the past. Uh, Davy Tree was a, a contractor who had been 
and Elizabeth, I'm sorry, I forget this term every time, like the tree warden or, or coming in and doing the inspections. They are the reviewing agent um, for the town for the tree preservation bylaw. So they were going to inspect all of the sites for which the bylaw was triggered. And then they gathered, you know, quite a bit of information about how the bylaw could be improved to better serve its purpose. And so these were recommendations um, and relatively minor ones that they recommended. So uh, we will open it up to public comment. You can use the raise hand function or you can um, hit star nine on your phone if you're calling in. Give everybody just a minute. And then, um, Chris, you can get the next article ready, 36, the Floodplain Conservancy District, please. And I'm not seeing any other hands. Making sure everybody has a chance to hit the hands if they want. All right, Chris, I think we're ready for uh, the next article, please. Okay, Kristen, this is our, my article, Article 36, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment to the Floodplain Conservancy District uh, Bylaw. Uh, next slide, please. In short, the reasons for this amendment is to make Concord's zoning bylaw with respect to floodplains conform to new model bylaw that the state has. Um, it's a uh, state model floodplain bylaw was updated in, in 2020, and it's a requirement for all communities in the uh, National Flood Insurance Program to adopt the bylaw updates. Uh, if not adopted, Concord property owners could no longer get flood insurance through the NFIP program. And next slide, please. The, there are a couple of additional changes that, that we're proposing that go um, sort of above and beyond the, the model bylaw. Uh, one is um, formalizing a one and a half to one compensatory flood storage requirement that's been in place for over 30 years. Uh, the, the model bylaw provides that it, it, any work, it fills a portion of the 100 year floodplain uh, by either earth or structure. Um, have an equal area on a one-to-one -one ratio of compensatory flood storage. Um, however, since the late 1970s, the town of Concord has had a policy that compensatory flood service shall be provided on a one-and-a-half-to-one ratio. And that was to ensure that any, any filling of the 100-year floodplain was adequately provided for in the case that there was surveying, engineering, or grading errors uh, that, that, were, that were inaccurate such that it resulted in flooding upstream or on adjacent properties. The, the the chain uh, having this one and a half to one compensatory uh, requirement could be waived by, by the ZBA um, subject. They could waive it down to a requirement for one to one compensatory storage. Next slide, please. In order to um, provide a waiver, the ZBA would need to receive a recommendation from the the NRC and uh, find that the project allows for an overall improvement to the site, such as reducing the volume of structure in the floodplain, improving stormwater management, or improving the natural environment. Again, that's to get from one and a half to one down to one to one. Next slide, please. So the benefit of the, the amendments provided for by this article are that, um, most importantly, adoption of the model uh, fl floodplain bylaw that has been adopted by the state allows the town to remain in the National Flood Insurance Program. And so property owners would continue to be able to purchase flood insurance. And it and that one and a half to one uh, compensatory storage requirement provides a margin of error in surveying and construction. It's also a proactive step to address increased frequency and duration of flooding that could result from climate change. Um, and that is the full presentation. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks, Burton. If there are any questions, please use the raise hand feature or star nine on your phone if you're calling in. Not seeing any hands up yet. I'll give it another minute while um, Chris pulls up the next article 37. This is the one I'm working on for um, minimum parking. Okay. Raised hands for um, floodplain, going once, going twice. All right. Um, Chris, I'm ready for the next one, please. Thank you. I'll just figure out how to look at my notes in time. All right. 
So Article 37 is about um, an amendment to Table 4 for the minimum parking requirements specific to uh, restaurant outdoor seasonal seating. You can go to the next slide, please. So during 2020, with indoor capacity for restaurants limited due to the pandemic, some restaurants were able to convert areas of parking lots to outdoor seating. And dining outdoors was certainly a welcome alternative for patrons, and it helped support economic vitality in town village centers. To allow these seating areas and parking lots, the select board and town manager waived parking requirements for outdoor seating, so restaurants weren't required to seek such a waiver from the Zoning Board of Appeals. This was in response to the declared state of emergency, and last summer, the select board issued special permits to about 10 restaurants. People were very happy to enjoy eating, eating out again, but also in the, um, the feedback was particularly positive about being able to eat outside. Next slide, please. Um, so I was curious and I asked about this, without the state of emergency, a restaurant that wanted to add outdoor seating could do so, as long as they could demonstrate they had additional parking spaces at the rate of one space for three outdoor seats. Um, however, currently, many restaurants are already operating with a special permit for relief from parking due to site limitations. In many cases, there isn't enough on-site parking to meet the current bylaw requirement of that one space per three seats rated capacity plus one space for employee, uh, each employee on the largest shift if you were to include the number of outdoor seats in that calculation. So those restaurants that could not accommodate additional parking or if they have already have a relief from parking requirements for what they already have, they would have to go to the ZBA for a special permit to get further relief from parking. So this state, what the state of emergency did was it allowed the select board and town manager to waive that need to get a special permit. Next slide, please. So the proposed amendment is intended to allow restaurants to have the opportunity to continue to offer seasonal outdoor dining without the need for a special permit by eliminating this required one space for three seats for only the uh, outdoor seating. Next slide, please. So as we have seen and, and many have experienced firsthand, the ability for our local restaurants to offer outdoor seating promotes economic vitality and creates more vibrant village centers. While parking remains a concern for many businesses and property owners, uh, allowing outdoor seating for restaurant owners without additional parking requirements gives added flexibility in managing existing staff and meeting the needs of their patrons without expanding operations. Now, if operations changed and additional staff is required, then additional parking would also be required. Next slide, please. So to address concerns about parking or general lack of, of in-town parking, which we on the board hear from many residents, the following information is important. Uh, the zoning bylaw amendment will not change the parking requirement for indoor seating of this one space for three seats rated capacity plus one space per employee on the largest shift. Additionally, the location of the outdoor seating is limited. The seasonal outdoor seating still needs to meet ADA and fire code requirements, such as distance between tables and aisle widths, Board of Health and Food Code requirements for the handling and delivery of food safely, and public safety requirements, such as tables not being allowed to be placed on sidewalks in a manner that diverts pedestrians into the street. Next, so sorry. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just summing up, if a restaurant is able to meet all of the existing requirements and provide an outdoor seating area, they will not need to obtain a special permit to waive parking requirements because of the additional seating. They have already demonstrated that they meet the parking requirements to handle the capacity of the restaurant. And we believe that restaurants that are able to offer outdoor seating will continue to do so within reason, since they're unlikely to dramatically increase the number of overall diners because everything else in the operations is sized for the current seating capacity. So with the passage of this amendment, we hope to see Concord residents and restaurant owners enjoying this outdoor dining experience well beyond when the state of emergency is planned. And with that, I'm happy to entertain questions. Please use the raise hand function or star nine on your phone and state your name and address for the record. And while we're waiting, I don't see anyone. Um, Chris, if you'd pull up Article 38, which is two families. And I'll give folks just another minute for questions about the minimum parking 
for table four. All right, I'm seeing no hands for this. Thank you for listening. And um, Nathan, I think you're up. I am, thank you. All right, Article 38, <clears throat> excuse my voice, the uh, <laughs> pollen has been uh, wreaking havoc with me. Uh, article 38 is complementary to an article passed at last year's town meeting, which allowed for a wider range of housing choices through the construction of additional dwelling units. Next slide, please. And so Article 38 is looking to amend Section 4.2.1 of the bylaw to allow zoning board, the Zoning Board of Appeals to grant special permit for the construction of a new two-family dwelling or alteration of an existing single-family dwelling into a two-family dwelling in the Residence C Zoning District. The Board may also allow reduction and reduce in required parking. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And so if you want to think about the amendments, uh, the objectives of the amendments, amendment, it creates additional housing. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot about looking for uh, smaller starter houses or downsizing houses. Um, and so that matches future needs. Uh, and it, the goal here is to maintain the character of the communities within residency. Um, uh, and, and to increase density around uh, what we we thought was important, which is transportation hubs and cultural centers. Um, next slide, please. So currently there are 162 families uh, in Concord. Most of them were built prior to uh, 1928 uh, zoning. 62% um, are within residency, including two condo conversions, um, and a, less than 1% of the 1,000 residency homes are currently two families. And if you drive through um, Concord, through what is residency, and we'll get to a map that shows exactly what residency is in a little bit, uh, you'll see a lot of these two family homes. So they, they're they pretty common. Uh, some of them have been converted since to single families, but the the you know style and scope of them is, uh, is prevalent throughout the town. Next slide, please. And so the first is just showing a, a map of residency um, around Concord Center and the Thoreau Depot area. Um, so you can see the streets that would be included um, for, for that segment of residency. Next slide, please. And then over in West Concord, you can see what residency uh, uh, encompasses the streets that are included there. Next slide, please. So just to go through, um, you know, some of the, take a moment to go through some of the basics and possible concerns. So absentee ownership would be allowed, as is the case currently with single family homes, uh, can be established as, uh, as a condo. Uh, the units must be attached. And I wanna add, as part of the special permit process, these developments will be reviewed to make sure um, that the way in which they are attached uh, to each other is both keeping in the spirit of the bylaw and also within the, the keeping of the community, the characteristics of the community. Um, all existing uh, size and setback requirements would be maintained. Uh, what that means is that though it's a two family house, it still would not exceed um, uh, you know, the, the total floor area ratio um, of, of a single family that would be on that same, that same lot. Um, parking requirements also ha uh, are also the same as a two-family, but again, as part of the special permit process, that could be reduced, particularly as the emphasis is on developing these around transportation hubs. So, if, if you know, you know, the goal is to look, you know, uh, to encourage people to use the transportation hubs that are they are near, uh, rather than uh, focusing on cars, and that's also the direction people are looking to purchase. Then, um, you know, that that. Uh, that matches that. And unit size would be determined by the dimensional requirements mentioned uh, earlier in terms of the setbacks and, and FAR. And uh, the permit itself would continue on in perpetuity uh, with the property. Uh, next slide, please. 
So why limit to resident C? Um, well, for anybody who's on the, on the line who remembers the conversations that the planning board had previously in coming up with this, they may remember we had a few iterations on on what the scope of, of this uh, bylaw amendment might be. Uh, we looked at a uh, half to three quarter mile walk, uh, walking distance. We thought about um, just a pure half mile radius. Um, at the end of the day, the existing residency district captured most of the area uh, being discussed under the other criteria, uh, which made for administration, administrative simplicity, uh, but also aligns um, the following existing factors, um, you know, adding density near the village centers for transportation and cultural purposes. Uh, all, you know, nearly all of the uh, existing two families are in that area already. Um, the Resident C, um, again, because of the dimension requirements, it would maintain a certain scale that, that made sense for smaller homes. Uh, and, um, and again, it removes the, the need to create a new overlay district, so that administrative uh, simplification. Next slide, please. And then this, we've talked about a little bit so far, but uh, overall, this is aligning with um, the town goals as set forth in Vision Concord. Um, and there's two uh, sections here that are outlined. Um, but again, focus on uh, density within those transportation hubs, cultural centers, uh, more mixed use, and really driving the uh, uh, the economy in those in those areas. Next slide. Thank you. Um, reasons for the special permit. Um, the planning board is proposing that a special permit be required for a two-family dwelling for a number of reasons. Uh, the residency zoning district is more dense, so there's potential that a project could impact the butter and could impact the butters. A special permit application to the ZBA is a discretionary permit and requires notification to those butters. Um, and as part of the review of the application by the ZBA, the board. Uh, has to make the findings regarding traffic safety, parking, which we've, we've talked about briefly, uh, neighborhood character, and natural environment. So those would be uh, made available as part of that process. Um, and this process is a way to help evaluate uh, a proposed two-family dwelling and whether it may have a significant impact or not. So again, um, you know, we're really thinking about uh, uh, introducing this in a way that, that uh, makes sense for the community, uh, and so part of that is allowing for that feedback from the community. Uh, next slide, please. I think that was the last one, yes. So um, you can take any questions or, or comments that uh, anyone on the line might have. Thanks, Nathan. Raise your hands. <laughs> um, can, can you promote Mary Hartman? And then please state your name and address for the record before your comment or question, please. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Mary Hartman and I'm the, I live on 16 Concord Green Unit 6. I'm the chair of the Finance Committee, but I'm here speaking for myself. Um, I think this is a great idea. Um, I'm wondering, have, do you have any estimate of how many moderately affordable units you'll be able to add to the housing stock inventory if this passes? Um, uh, that's a great question. We've. Uh, we had that asked a few times. I, I think you know part of this is um, allowing the space for developers to uh, to build this type of housing. Um, so it's <laughs> we're not quite sure where that is going to land. Um, so I don't have an immediate answer for you uh, on that. But uh, I don't know, Elizabeth, if you want to add anything in there, yeah. So specifically, the zoning bylaw does um, this amendment uh, does not have a specific requirement that the units be deed restricted affordable um, in any manner and um, go towards the subsidized housing inventory. I understand. Um, so what the planning board's discussion over these past two years uh, has been is that um, by its nature, you know, the units two units on the same same lot as a single family dwelling, they'd be smaller and, um, you know, by that that role, they would be, you know, a little bit more affordable, but there's no deed restriction requirement that they be um, at 80% area median income and on the subsidized housing inventory. No, I understand that. 
I'm wondering, do, are, these are moderately affordable, right? These are not on the housing inventory, as you said. So these are, are not part of our housing inventory for the 40 bait, right? So these right. are not moderate, right? Or I call moderate, maybe workforce housing or whatever you we would like. call it. But I was just wondering, so how many do you think are would be converted now possibly? And then the I guess what I'm hearing is you're hoping that this incents builders to come in and build two families. And so that's hard to estimate whether that will be successful or not. Exactly. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they, they cannot right now. So the, like I said, this is just allowing the space for for that type of development to, to take place. Okay. Um, but you're not expecting a lot of conversions of homes right now into two families? No. It, it, it's it's really <laughs> hard to tell what okay. so, what is going to, you know, it, it, I, I, the feedback that we have um, received and the board has received is that there are um, there are a few um, homeowners that uh, don't have the space necessarily to um, do an accessory dwelling unit um, but want to be able to have a two family um, that is legally they can you know they can condoize it and they can sell it. Um, live in the other half and don't necessarily have to be um, renters or find renters. Um, so it's just, it's a, it's another tool um, to go along with the accessory dwelling unit bylaw that was passed last year. Great. Okay. Thank you. It's a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see another hand up from Brooks Ware. Oops. Sorry. Hi. Uh, good evening. Um, I would just like to uh, reiterate. Uh, Sorry. Would you, you mind stating today? your name and address for the record, please? I apologize. Uh, my name is Brooks Ware. My address is 277 Deacon Haynes Road. Um, we uh, we actually own a property and intend to uh, take advantage of uh, this bylaw amendment. Uh, as as soon as we're possibly able, um, uh, and so uh, I had actually a um, besides being strongly in support of the amendment, um, I had a follow up question for um, Ms. Hartman. Uh, I'm not sure what the range is in terms of moderately priced units. What we consider moderately priced, and where that begins and ends. So, I don't, um, so I don't think we have a definitive uh, number for that. So, so I mean, there, once again, there there is no um, affordable um, requirement as part of this um, zoning bylaw amendment. Um, whether that is um, deed restricted at eighty percent, or um, whether there's a requirement that it be moderately priced, there's there is no affordable restriction or requirement with the zoning bylaw. Um, the understanding that the board has um, and discussions they've had in the past two years, again, goes back to um, you know, these will primarily be um, two smaller units on a lot where it could have been a much you know, larger single family dwelling. And by that nature, um, the units will be, you know, Hopefully, you know, less costly than if it was just a larger single-family dwelling. But there's there's no restriction or requirement for any affordability level. Uh, I I totally agree with you. By by simply by virtue of the smaller square footage, they they will be more moderately priced. Um, uh, for everybody's information, what we envision would be probably. 25 to 30 percent below the current uh, median price um, of a home, which has gone really um, <laughs> quite a bit upwards in the last year, uh, as everybody knows. But um, but philosophically, that's what we're after in terms of um, the activities that we want to pursue um, developing in the town. So anyway, thank you very much for bringing the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. I see a hand up from Dory Kehoe. If you can um, state your name and address when you're unmuted, please. Can you 
you try unmuting yourself? Oh, there I'm you are. I'm trying to do that, and it's. Oh, oh, we we just heard you a minute yeah, ago. There you go. Oh. Now, yes. Okay, good. Um, Dory Dory Keo, uh, 51 MacArthur Road, and the reason the question I'd like to ask is: many of the people in large homes and not in residence C would be interested in doing something similar to this, which is now not not allowed. Is there any looking forward? Is there any thoughts of, of trying to consider this in, in some of the other residence districts? Not to yeah, build so, so much, but to transfer from a larger home to a smaller, to two to subdivided. Yeah, so that was a that was one thing that we discussed uh, within the planning board um, uh, last year when we were developing this. And the, I think the initial thought was that residency in terms of of the focus on the transportation hubs, cultural centers, and also the um, the scale of of the units that would be developed kind of made sense when we were looking for uh, you know potentially more little a affordable uh, um, housing. Um, but <clears throat> I also want to make clear that one of the things that we discussed was depending on the success and interest of this, we can always expand it out, right? So we can always expand out to um, other residents, uh, zoning, uh, resident zones, uh, or, you know, <laughs> revisit the idea of how to determine which, uh, which areas are included, uh, under this bylaw. But yes, it's, it's definitely been discussed and the thought is, is that we can review and expand as, uh, as desired. Good. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I see a hand up from Stefan Bader. If you'll state your name and address for the record when you're unmuted, please. Stephen Bader, Seven River Street. Um, I just have two quick uh, comments. Number one, I would use the full name Envision 20 Concord 2030 long range plan in case you have people at the town meeting who aren't familiar with that. That's the slide shows it in shorthand, but there may be some new residents at town meeting this year who've just moved into town as they escape the city. And uh, my other comment was this does require two thirds approval. Is that correct? Or are we under the new rules already? I just want to clarify that point. I'm fully in favor of it. You're right. Two, two thirds for all of these um, bylaws to um, changes to the zoning bylaws. Okay, thank you. So to your um, question specifically deals with the uh, recent amendments to um, the Zoning Act Chapter 40A, um, which for certain um, certain bylaws that promote the creation of housing will now only require a simple majority. Um, the cutoff is for multifamily, which the state has defined as three or more. So that's why this would not um, be eligible for a simple majority. Got it. Good to know. That, that That's a useful explanation at that town meeting as well. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other hands up, but let me give people another moment while you pull up. Um, I believe it. Oh, wait, I see one more hand up. Um, Matt Johnson, please state your name and address for the record when you're unmuted. Oh, shoot. Um, my, my we, we can hear you. I mean, is it working? But let's go ahead. Um, so, uh, first of all, thanks for bringing this to town meeting this year. Um, my question was: I'm sorry. Uh, can you many, state your name and address? Matt Johnson, for the 21 Winthrop Street. Um, former member of the planning board, currently a member of the select board, but speaking for myself. And uh just asking first of all uh just a point of reference there was a question about how many units this is likely to produce and while that can't be absolutely predicted it might be helpful reference to hear how many accessory dwelling units have received building permits under the bylaw amendment that was passed last year um, so that that's my first question and i think the second was just a clarification i believe that again while this bylaw amendment doesn't uh have any requirements related to affordability the, that question that was asked about well what does qualify as moderate affordable i believe it's 
you know, anything between 80% of the uh, median area income uh, and 150% in Concord. It's sometimes 140 or 120 in other places, but uh, 150% of median would be like the upper limit of what people typically consider moderately affordable. But again, it has no bearing on this bylaw amendment. We hope that you get more of those, but um, it, it isn't necessary. So, so back to my original question though, um, any idea of how many building permits have been issued for the accessory dwellings under the new bylaw? I don't know um, specifically, which um, we'll find out the answer um, and can you know post that on the planning board's website and have it available for a town meeting or actually um, the board, what I'd probably recommend is have the board include that, um, that number in their written report to town meeting uh, so that that answer is already there. I can tell you um, just off the top of my head, um, I know of at least um, six, um, you know, six accessory dwellings that have already gone through. Um, and, and that's just the ones that I know of um, for the accessory dwellings that meet all the requirements. It's just a building permit. So right. I may not necessarily know, but we can, um, I can find out that answer and have the board include that in their written report to town meeting. Yeah, the ones that come before the ZBA are easy enough to see, it's the others. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. And Barbara Powell. Aha. Am I off mute? Yep, we can hear you. Could you state your name and address, please? Yes, Barbara Powell, 316 Heathbridge Road, um, a member of the Concord Housing Foundation, actually. I wondered if the limitation to uh, Zone C was based at all on the assumption that uh, people who need affordable housing don't have cars or are limited somehow by the need to have access to public transportation. I don't think that was, um, I, it's been a while since we have, <laughs> we had our initial discussions about this, but I don't believe that was part of um, our original thinking on this. So, so that's not a, going forward, that's not an assumption that needs to be dealt with. No. I mean, I guess I would say not directly because part of, <clears throat> excuse me, part of the overall view is just that we're, we want to encourage people to use the existing public transportation that is there. Um, and that is also part of the reason why the, uh, you know, the parking aspect is um, something that can also be reviewed as part of the special permit so that, um, you know, as a, if a builder is just looking to, you know, build for particular buyers or, in terms of space, uh, spacing and packaging, for example, of, of the property, um, that we can do that, uh, again, to encourage just you know, more people being able to live closer to the transportation uh, uh, hubs and the, the town centers. Okay, thank you. Thanks, I don't see any other hands up right now. So while we're getting ready, for the last article, Article 39 about earth removal. Just give folks another minute. Oh, I see a hand up, Jim Trant. Mr. Trent, you're on the panel. If you could just um, unmute your mic. Hi. I live in 31 Rose Street, and on the agenda, Article 32, 
had something to do with the historic district collection. And I joined, I don't know, five or eight minutes late. And we were already on article 36. So did I miss what was being planned on exit 32? Uh, you did, but I think um, Peter Nobley is still on the line. Did you have a question? We can see if we can have him answer it. I just wondered what the status was with respect to the decision or what information was needed to help with the decision on how Article 32 was going to be designed. And Peter, we, we made you presenter again if you want to respond, but... Um, sure, I, I, if you can hear me, I can't start my video. Jim, there, was, uh, there were just a couple questions and it sailed right through, so no controversy. And that's good. What does it mean? Does it mean it will be historic or will it stay non-historic? It will now go to town meeting for the town to vote on it. Okay. So it's, does that make sense? We're just going to continue as, as planned. Okay, great. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for coming. Yep. You bet. All right. Thank you to you both. And I see um, one more hand up, Charles Phillips. Mr. Phillips on the panel, if you could um, activate your mic. There we go. Uh, we can hear you if you can state your name and address for the record. Oh, yeah. I'm uh, Charles Phillips, 65 Fairhaven Road. Uh, I may have um, uh, just tuned in. I might have missed this from before, but due to the um, new legislation that, that I believe was passed at the at the state house, um, does this article require a two thirds vote or, or just a simple majority? Thanks for the question. It does require a two thirds vote. And Elizabeth, you had a great explanation for the articles that require a simple majority, none of which um, apply to this year's uh, articles from the planning board. Oh, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I'm not surprised because I, you know, you know, I think that 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 an issue relating to housing would have uh, would have been one that that uh, the state wanted to be passed by majority. Um, yes, uh, the amendments made to Chapter 40A that allow for a simple majority for the creation of housing uh, deals with multifamily, and the state has defined multifamily as three or more units. So this would not apply since it's okay. only a duplex. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, Chris, if you'd bring up the last article, please. And I think, Helly, you're going to present for us. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, last article is Article 39, um, Earth Removal. So a um, couple of updates that we are proposing here. Um, is this the first slide? Oh, I had a different first slide. Um, I don't think, is there a slide? It looks like three. Yeah. Okay, next slide. You got to, oh, yeah. there we go. Um, so, yeah, a couple of items are being proposed here. Um, you know, so, Earth removal regulates um, primarily earth removal greater than a thousand cubic yards, um, but not fill that's brought into the site. So um, sort of a global change being proposed here is to just add the word fill um, 
to a number of spots so that it, it covers removal and fill um, over for, uh, you know, a thousand cubic yards that might be brought onto the site. Um, and then aside from that, uh, we're, we're kind of clarifying a lot of um, areas in the language and again, focusing on <clears throat> the par part of the bylaw <clears throat> that focuses on greater than a thousand cubic yards removal or fill. Um, you know, one area in particular we just found to be a bit vague and wanted to clarify that existing language and um, incorporate some more measurable um, objectives and definitions um, for the zoning board to consider in granting approval. Um, and then, you know, related to that and, and similarly, you know, adding adding in a criteria specific to sustainable sustainability and sustainable objectives. Um, we can go to the next slide. Haley, I'm sorry. I think there's a delay, but I'm on slide three right now. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, kind of says the same same thing here, uh, but the one area in particular that that we're proposing to to make changes to, as far as language is concerned, is again just making it a bit more clear um, and and focusing on the fact that you know the making sure the applications that are coming in under this bylaw, um, you know, minimize changes to existing, uh, you know, existing contours, natural landscape, habitat and, and connections and, and are thinking more in a sustainable way. Um, next slide. Um, again, just uh, sort of the nitty gritty language that that we are um, have, have has been updated. Uh, we've added some definitions to um, dust, odor, noise, uh, and I, I don't remember Elizabeth if we did washouts and traffic necessarily, but um, you know, again, just adding more clarity around what will be considered um, in in the application. Next slide. And then the final piece that we've proposed to add in um, was uh, taken from, from, I believe, the town of Plymouth. They have very similar language that um, you know, we liked and that it requires an alternative analysis um, by the applicants to you know, make sure that they are kind of thinking about more than one design um and, and especially one that would minimize earth, earth removal or land disruption um and then you know sort of discussing the advantages and disadvantages of of alternatives um so again this was almost taken verbatim from the town of plymouth uh their earth removal bylaw next slide i'm not sure if that's okay and then Again, um, just added some definitions to particular um, criteria. And then adding a purpose um, to the overall bylaw. Thank you. If there are any questions, please use the raise hand function or uh, star nine on your phone. <laughs> Pamela Dritt, you'll be promoted to panelist and you can unmute yourself and state your name and address, please. Pamela Dritt, 13 Concord Green, Unit 4. Thank you for this. This is a wonderful thing, I think. I hope it passes. I wonder if we could, in the future, consider adding uh, language about, about maintaining soil integrity, as we have recently learned of the extreme importance of the soil um, 
in terms of the fungal network that feeds the plants and the, uh, the whole ecology of the area. Um, also, I thought, oh, this is good because the zoning board needs discretion. And then I read the actual current one. You already have discretion. It says you may grant a permit. It doesn't say you must. It doesn't say, say you will. So even if the applicant fulfills the three um, requirements, it still doesn't mean you have to grant them. Uh, but this will make it even more clear. Thank you. Thank you. One, one more question. Is this meeting being recorded so those of us who came in late can go watch it? It is. Thank you. So if, uh, if anyone else has any other questions, please use the raise hand function. I'm not seeing any other hands up, so let me give uh, folks just another minute or so to figure out where the button is and raise their hand. Thank you to the planning board folks who have presented tonight. And thanks, Elizabeth, for preparing all the presentations and uh, all of the language for the warrant. We really appreciate that. And um, I know uh, the town moderators on the line, Carmen Reese. Carmen, I don't know if you have anything to add in, in any concluding moments. I hope that we put you to sleep, basically, and uh, everything goes in the consent calendar. But raise your hand if you'd like us to promote you, otherwise you are off the hook. Good evening, everyone. Uh, no, you didn't put me to sleep. It's always very interesting. Uh, it, it's interesting uh, how very aware people are of the changes in Chapter 40A and wondering already how that might impact our uh, zoning bylaws. Uh, and it doesn't appear to have any impact on anything that we have on the um, uh, on the warrant this year. Um, uh, I, I um, uh, just will remind folks that there won't be audio and visual presentations on the articles at town meeting this year, and there will be a town meeting materials uh, booklet that will have narrative explanation uh, as well as the planning board report and recommendations. Uh, and um, uh, folks are really encouraged to spend some time on the website reviewing the hearings and the uh, supporting materials that will be posted there to educate themselves on the articles before the meeting. And again, we'll have uh, a very robust uh, consent um, calendar. I'd be interested to know whether there are any articles that the planning board feels uh, should not go on the consent calendar or whether you would be content to see uh, all of this year's zoning bylaw amendments go on the consent calendar. And by the way, no decisions are made yet. This will be something that I'll review with the select board next Monday night. Thank you very much. Um, I imagine uh, we can be in touch through Elizabeth. Um, Certainly. If, if there's yep. anything uh, that we think warrants more discussion. Thanks, we appreciate it. Thank you. And I see it looks like one more final question, Roger Rush. Roger, you can unmute yourself and then state your name and address. Hi, I'm Roger Rush, 67 Kern Street. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, sorry, let me start the video. Um, there are various statements about uh, controlling climate um, in the language that you presented. But I also wonder whether it's we would consider mention of um, pollutants um, adding to, you know, uh, if if the permit um, is would would be um, would have some some additional 
for example, you know, the one that's local to me, it would add to local pollutants from the, uh, uh, from the railway line. Um, but, you know, if you, just some way in which we can, we can have some control on adding to climate change um, for such an application. Am I clear or what? I think so. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, I know, Elizabeth, we've kind of gone back and forth with what, uh, like, we as a planning board are able to do, you know, from not overstep our boundaries from, like, a so state. So, for example, the, you know, large earth removal involves adding a lot of diesel pollutants to, to the local atmosphere. Um, that's not very friendly. Yeah, so my understanding, and Elizabeth jumped in here, I guess, but it was that we, you know, we as a planning board of Concord only have, you know, we can't sort of regulate certain things like versus the state, um, can't, you know, sort of take away the state's ability to, to, to oversee certain climate change related criteria, right? Um, so, um Town, cities and towns, uh, as far as the planning board's jurisdiction, uh, they do not have the ability to override certain state and federal uh, statutes and regulations. Um, one of those is specifically the Clean Air Act. Um, others are like the building, the building code, um, plumbing code. So there's uh, different state regulations and laws and federal regulations and laws where uh, communities um, do not have the ability to um, to basically uh, implement something that goes against those state and federal regulations. Uh, and the um, Clean Air Act and DEP's jurisdiction as it relates to air quality is one of those. Yeah, okay, well, I, I did see the wording <coughs> which restricts the, the uh, you know, the amount of, of, of vehicle movements, which is is kind of engenders what I'm saying anyway. Um, right, so that would um, vehicle move, move or, you know, truck traffic, um, specifically to the impact that truck traffic has on um, roadways, um, vehicle pedestrian safety, um, a direct abutters, uh, you know, yeah, generally. But when you re when you regulate that, there there is an added benefit of um, you know reducing um, the air quality issues that go along with that. But um, that's not the primary um, criteria that the board would be able to use. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the question. All right, um, seeing no other hands up, Elizabeth, is there anything else we need to do before we close the public hearing? Okay, um, then we will close. But thank you everybody for coming. Um, and as uh, town moderator said, please read all the materials available to read before uh, town meeting and we will see everybody then. And we will close this public hearing and adjourn the meeting at 8.04 p.m. Thank you, have a nice night, everyone. Okay, everybody.